this is the systemic model, and Wheaton is one of those. We have our doctrinal statement. It is these 12 items. It's pretty bare bones. It's not anything like the full, big old uh, confessions that you find elsewhere. It's too thin for that. In fact, some people think it's too thin because it's not that. The Roman Catholic Catechism numbers about 700 pages of teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. The Westminster Confession, one of the great con uh, Protestant confessions, about 75 pages, uh, including the Latin and English transl translation. Well, we just have these 12 you know, pretty brief points. And yet for some people, those 12 points are too many. You know, we need to cut back and have just an Apostles' Creed type definition at Wheaton, and until we do, they're not happy with us, we're not inclusive enough, and so on. You know, uh, how an institution sets itself and where it sets those boundaries and how it defines how broadly or narrowly it's going to define itself, the systemic institution, uh, that varies from institution to institution. It goes back to the history of the school, the constituency, the governing board. In our case, the governing board is the one that sets uh, these boundaries for us. Well, so you have, first of all, the nature of the institution. Are you systemic or are you umbrella? I just want you to know when I'm using the term Christian college for tonight at least, I'm talking about uh, the systemic model. Uh, this is what we're talking about. Secondly, there is this breadth itch issue of how broadly or narrowly you define uh, the, the systemic stance of the institution. You know, we have our 12 points and after that this place is a zoo. But on those 12 items, every one of us have said, yes, this is where I stand on these 12 items. So we, we have that definition. You can find places that are tighter than us and broader than us. Uh, but the, the breadth issue is a second issue. And then there's a third issue that really weighs heavily into all of this, and that's just the integrity issue. Um, and the question is, uh, when someone comes and the institution says, this is who we are, and um, uh, this person is being invited to join and asked if they stand where the institution stands, you know, how tightly, what are our expectations of that person's, of that affirmation? For example, at a place like Wheaton, when a faculty member is shown this definition of Wheaton College, this is who we are, and the basic question is, is this who you are? Do you agree with this? Are these your convictions? You know, that's really what this person is being asked, or the president, or a board member, or anybody else uh, who joins uh, the institution. The question is, uh, the, the one of integrity and in how that, that answer comes. And you wouldn't think, at least I wouldn't think, that there would be much problem with integrity there, but uh, we are living in very strange times. Um, when in fact that question gets raised all the time. There is an article right now in the latest books in culture that I found astonishing. I use the word astonishing rather than the word appalling. I probably would prefer the word appalling. Um, and it, it's a book, it's an article by Andrew LePoe, as different as we think, Catholics and Protestants. And basically here's the thesis of this article. He's talking about, he's from a Catholic background. He's going to marry a wife from an uh, evangelical Protestant background. And so they wanted to have a joint wedding of a Catholic priest and a past Presbyterian pastor they knew. And so they were going to have these two officiate. And everything was going smoothly, he says, until all that was left before setting out in this pilgrimage was to sign a little document that was presented to him kind of at the last minute by the Roman Catholic priest. This little document for the church that said we would raise our kids Catholic. Okay, so oh, suddenly they're saying, oh, now here's something we're being asked to affirm. And this is what this article is about. Uh, he says, this is, uh, here's where I began to find out that Catholics and Protestants were even more different than I thought. He understands all the, the theological differences between the two, but he's really trying to go for something different. The Catholics and Protestants, evangelical Protestants in particular, are really different in how they think, he says. When we sought counsel from a wide variety of friends and mentors, the Protestant evangelicals consistently said, you can't sign that. That is a huge promise you're making. To do so is to commit yourself to the church and everything it teaches. Do you really believe everything it says? The Catholics were also consistent, he said, but they said something like, don't worry about the details. Go ahead and sign it. It just means you'll raise your kids as Christians. 
following your conscience as God leads you. And if he leads you to a different church later on, no problem. He says, I exaggerate these two reactions, but only a bit to make a point. For Protestants, the document was a fixed text and to sign it was to irrevocably align ourselves with that text. What mattered were the propositions, the statements that defined reality. They were the reality. For Catholics, it was not just the document that was primary. It was the community, the people of God, the unity of the people of God. If signing the document could help you preserve that unity, by all means, sign it, and then do what your conscience requires. He says, here were two very different ways of thinking, two different mental maps, two different ways of understanding the world and living in it. And he summarizes it this way, that evangelicals tend to think in either-or terms. Catholics, by contrast, are very happy to think in terms of both and. Uh, as I say, I find that analysis of things appalling, uh, and that it would show up in books and culture all the more, because this is not a contrast between Catholics and Protestants. Uh, the, the idea of the contrast between either or and both and, I mean, sometimes you need to be either or and sometimes you need to be both and, and in many ways that's the contrast between an educated person and an uneducated person. You know, students often start out here, uh, they come out of high school and everything's black and white, it's either or. By the time they finish, they're much broadly and more deeply educated and they realize things are often more complex than that and they've learned to handle complexity and nuance and the both and starts making a lot more sense. Uh, that's part of just becoming um, uh, an educated person. The idea of setting that out as Catholic Protestant, I think, is nonsense. But the deeper issue is basically saying, talking about this document that he's signing. The Catholic Church is saying, will you make a commitment to raise your children in the Catholic Church? And according to him, his Catholic, the, the, the Protestants are saying to him, well, if you put your word to that, you, you need to be ready to follow through. The Catholics, he said, said, don't worry about it. You go ahead and sign it. You don't have to live that out. I, I, again, I think it's appalling. It's a slam on the Catholic Church, or Catholics, that Catholics think that way. In fact, at the end of the article, he talks about the, the priest. It says, uh, Father Pendergrast said that these things should be decided before the wedding so they don't interrupt or trouble the marriage later. In other words, you're making a commitment on the front end, and the Catholic Church understands that to be a commitment. This is not something, go ahead and sign it, get what you want, and then you know, roll with it. Come on, relax. B back off. Don't, don't take any of it too seriously. This is not Catholic Protestant stuff. This is a question of integrity. We have very explicit instruction in the Word of God on this. That I, and what's appalling to me is the way it's all being... Uh, just brushed over. When the Lord Jesus says, let your yes be yes, and let your no be no. And he says it several different times in several different places. His brother James picks up on it, says, let your yes be yes, and let your no be no. When you give your word and you say yes, then by God mean yes. And I mean literally by God mean yes, or don't say it. The Apostle Paul several times says, I was not among you. He's being accused of being uh, two-faced. And he said, I was not among you as a yes, yes, and a no, no. I was not one of those people that you couldn't trust what I said. This is a sheer issue of integrity. In fact, one of the great moral heroes of, for all of us is a Roman Catholic hero, a Thomas More, who at the, at the cost of his life refused to affirm something he didn't believe. All he had to do was to sign this thing approving this divorce in the line of succession. And he said, I can't do that. His integrity would not let him do this. A Roman Catholic man uh, with a passion for letting his yes be yes and his no be no. And here is an article in Books and Culture just telling, hey, two different ways of thinking. They're both valid in their own ways. You, you affirm something. You don't really have to live that out. Come on, it's in the ballpark. Go with it. That's disastrous for us as Christians. Are you going to make your marriage vows that way? Well, I said that at the altar, sure. But I mean, you know, here we are five years later. Is that not a, that's disastrous. When we say yes, it needs to mean yes or don't say it. When we say no, we mean just no, we shouldn't say it. 